All right. Good morning, P10 Ice Daily Show. Happy Thursday morning. Hope your day is off to a great start. My name is Alan. I'm happy to be here this morning on Leadership Thursday. Currently, I have the pleasure of serving as the Chief Operating Officer here at ICE and a faculty member in our fitness athlete division. Here on Leadership Thursday, we talk all things small business management, practice ownership, and management. It's Leadership Thursday, which also means it's Gut Check Thursday. So Gut Check Thursday this week, a little bit of interval work. We've got a 21.59 of calories on a fan bike with some box jumps, so low box jump hike for everybody to begin with, and then some alternating dumbbell snaps. So very redundant on the lower body. Then we're going to rest one to one, and then we're going to begin again this time with a higher box under a little bit more fatigue, and we're going to do some alternating dumbbell push presses. We're going to do a couple reps on one arm, a couple reps on the other, back and forth, just to make a really small amount of reps feel that much more annoying uh, by needing to hold that dumbbell in the front rack position and encounter some more time and attention. I like this workout. I wrote it for myself and my wife uh, last week to do in the basement. Very simple dumbbell box fan bike can get it done in the garage, the basement, the clinic. Very easy to modify as well for patients. Reduce the calories on the bike, reduce the height on that box, reduce the weight on that dumbbell. Uh, maybe even think about step ups uh, in place of the box jumps, but a really nice workout where we're trying to think about getting through that 21.15.9, resting, and even though the reps go down, complexity goes up a little bit, and getting about the same amount of time done on the backside with the second part of the workout. So have fun with that. Courses coming your way, we have a ton. Uh, we are busier for 2023 already than we have been for all of 2022. So you'll see us out on the road a lot. Uh, there's a bunch of courses coming your way. I'm just going to talk about some coming up the next few weeks. Uh, in uh, two weeks, January 28th and 29th, we have Zach Morgan coming to Memphis, Tennessee for Lumbar Spine Management. And that same weekend, we'll have Lindsey Huey down in St. Augustine, Florida for Extremity Management. The weekend of February 4th and 5th, we have a bunch of courses going on. We'll have Fitness Athlete Live down in Doral, Florida. That's just outside of Miami. That'll be with Joe Hinesco. We'll have Zach on the road again for lumbar spine management, this time in Boulder, Colorado. We'll have Alex Germano out in Oregon for Older Adult Live. We'll also have Christina down in, I'm probably going to mess this up, Ch Ch Choctaw, Choctaw, Oklahoma, I'm sorry. Also for Older Adult Live that same weekend of the 4th and the 5th. And then we'll have Lindsay Huey here at uh, Health HQ in Fenton, Michigan for Extremity Management. And then online courses coming your way in the immediate future. We have Fitness Athlete Advanced Concepts starting February 28th. Tons of courses, pietonice.com. Check out all of the courses on our schedule. We always get a question, when are you coming here? Where are you going there? Uh, the best way to bring us to you uh, so you don't have to travel is to reach out on that host of course page uh, and talk to us about hosting a course uh, with your clinic or your clinic group. That's also the only way to get a discount on a course unless you happen to be a student or military veteran. So check out host a course. Uh, we are booking pretty much all the way through 2023, some divisions now into next year, 2024, uh, but we might have some availability left. So reach out to us and talk about what it looks like to bring an ice course out to your neck in the woods. So if you want to see a course, host it. So let's get into today's topic, uh, boundaries, burnout, and behavior shaping, a lot of alliteration there. Um, we're going to talk about uh, some stories first, a little bit of story time, and then we're talking about the concept, the, the, the psychological concept of behavior shaping. Uh, it sounds manipulative. Uh, maybe you've never heard of it. It sounds maybe manipulative. Uh, maybe it sounds uh, kind of scammy, like maybe uh, essential oils or, or weird types of creatine, uh, but it is a concept that I think is important uh, for everybody to know about if you don't know. Uh, something that has helped me a lot, uh, especially in the past year. So we'll talk about behavior shaping. I want to start first with the tale of a dog. My dog in particular, his name is Dash. He's a wonderful dog. He's a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. If you don't know that breed, uh, they look like little bodybuilders, uh, kind of look like a little mini pit bull. Very loyal, very affectionate dogs. Very uh, Velcro style dog is a good way to describe them. Always want to be getting pet, laying on you, sitting on you. Uh, and basically just looking for affection constantly. So uh, I've had Dash for a couple of years now. And when my wife and I found out that we were pregnant, we thought, oh boy, that's not really going to uh, do well with how Dash behaves, where he 
jumps up on you, uh, where he uh, tries to lay on your chest a lot, lay uh, lay on your lap. Um, that's really not going to work when my wife's pregnant. It's especially going to not work when we have a little kid around the house, especially when my wife is breastfeeding. Uh, and we really started to worry about how that would affect, would we have to get rid of the dog? Would we just have to have the dog locked up or chained up or something all the time? Uh, not an old dog, but an older dog, a middle-aged dog, you could say. He's got a little bit of gray hair. He's uh, six now. Uh, is it too late for him to change his behavior? So we consulted with and hired a dog trainer um, and it basically said these are you know, his behaviors. And we started with the idea of we need some change. And it was a wonderful experience working with a dog trainer of having her tell us, listen, uh, this, this is not impossible. It requires uh, firm, consistent reinforcement of what you want his ideal behavior to be. And basically the creation of boundaries that you don't have currently. He's allowed on the couch. He's allowed in your bedroom. He's allowed on your bed. He, he has no boundaries. Uh, and therefore his behavior currently is okay, but is about to become less than ideal. And we need to start shaping his behavior. We need to start giving him commands and positively reinforcing when he performs those commands and basically making sure that he understands a few simple commands that keep him in his place and keep him inside of his boundary and outside of where you do not want him to be. And we did do this through the, the use of a, a little reinforcement collar, not a shot collar or a, a spike collar, but a little training collar, just a little, a little love tap. Uh, and it was a great experience. And now Dash knows how to sit. He knows how to place up on his bed and stay there. He knows how to heal when we're walking so he doesn't try to run off into somebody's yard. Um, he knows how to stay off now and not jump on people when they when they come into the house. And it was a great experience learning uh, how to shape Dash's behavior. And now the same can be done with humans. It's tougher. Usually we don't put shot collars on people and, and zap them to uh, change their behavior, but it can be done with people. And I also learned that uh, this past year that it can be done with people. And it's, it's probably the most important thing we don't do is establish boundaries with people um, and start to shape uh, how we want them to behave when they work with us, when they're near us, when they're friends with us, when they otherwise interact with us on a regular basis. So I began therapy back in the fall for uh, what my goal was of increasing my frustration tolerance and explaining just situations that made me frustrated in the, in the course of therapy and saying like, um, you know, this is usually how I respond. I usually kind of respond hot headed. I think people may think that I mean, um, or I go the other way and just kind of check out and don't say anything when something upsets me. And learning in therapy that the concept is pretty similar when working with people of that we need to learn to behave, uh, to, to behavior shape. And also through doing that, establish our boundaries as a person uh, so that those people do not infringe upon those boundaries and create situations where that kind of negative reaction even has a chance to occur. And again, it's tougher. We can't, can't zap people with a collar. It's, uh, it takes even longer than it does with a dog. Uh, and it's definitely a much more difficult situation, uh, but it can be done. So reducing those situations uh, where we get frustrated with how people interact with us and learning to establish those boundaries. And I think reflecting on this concept of burnout, it's talked all the time. There's books, there's courses, there's a million different things to do about managing your burnout. And I'm of the firm belief that no amount of vacations or meditation or cold plunges or self-help books or courses on managing your burnout will do anything if we're really dealing with the true cause here, which is a missed balance equation. If we think back to chemistry, think about ions positive and negative charges, balancing those chemical equations. Maybe you black that part of your memory out from, from undergrad. It was just a course you had to take to get into PT school. But, but balancing those equations, you can never balance those. If you think about lab where maybe you made table salt, those equations will never balance. You'll never finish and actually say, look, professor, I made the table salt just like uh, the lab instructions said. We can never get there if there's always an influx of things that are constantly going to be uh, creating a misbalance in that chemical equation. We have a positive sodium ion, we have a negative chloride ion. If they're balanced, they come together. We get a salt, we get a physical salt, we get table salt. 
But if we have too much sodium coming in or not enough chloride, we have a misbalance, it's never going to work out. We're just going to have some random chemicals sitting in solution uh, in a really unproductive manner. So that is the concept of if people are always crossing our boundaries, this happens a lot. We'll talk about how it happens. But if people are always crossing our boundaries, we always have that influx of too much stuff on one side of the equation that's never going to, to get balanced out. Uh, and we're always going to find that we have that feeling of burnout, like we're never getting ahead, like we're frustrated. And now those, those changes to the equation come in a lot of different ways. Working too much, <laughs> doing too much of the same stuff, not having enough time off. Certainly, we can start to remedy the equation a little bit if we work less, if we take more vacation. Uh, but really, when we start to establish boundaries of how we want people to treat us and behave in our presence, we find that we don't need to worry about that stuff as much because that that stress load, that mental load that we start to feel just doesn't get as high. Same concept we do all the time in the gym physically. We lift weights, we do cardiovascular conditioning. So that stuff like walking and picking up a light box in the garage does no longer challenge us. If we can establish really good boundaries and start to shape behavior of those that we work and interact with, then we really will never challenge that capacity where we need to think, I need to quit my job. I need to look for a different job. I need to go on a six month vacation and, and get away from it all. We never quite reach that point where we've hit our capacity. We create that little buffer zone that lets us operate and function, function and thrive. So talking about boundaries, what are our boundaries? The answer is it depends. It's it's totally up to you uh, to know what are your boundaries and what you're comfortable with in your daily life in regards to uh, work and how friends and family members interact with you. So only you know what's important for you and kind of what you want to create a little boundary, a little fence around in your life. Certainly, we can look at basic needs. We are, unfortunately, as of right now, mortal. We, we still need food and, and water and sleep and shelter. Kind of think of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Some of us fail to even put boundaries around these basic needs, and this is a good place to start. Think of those of you who maybe work through lunch. You're expected to document through lunch. Uh, maybe you are expected to do documentation on your own time at home, unpaid after the work day has ended that might infringe upon dinner, right? Um, that, that might infringe upon that lunch. Even your basic needs are not being met. And you can imagine how that starts to increase that frustration and reach that, that top end capacity of where we start to feel stressed and we start to have that feeling of maybe being burned out. So starting to establish boundaries of I'm going to take an hour for lunch uh, a day and I'm going to not work through lunch. I'm going to sit down and eat my lunch or maybe I don't eat lunch. Instead, I'm going to use that hour and I'm going to work out or go run errands or whatever. But having that break, putting a boundary around it is very, very important. In this category of basic needs, I would also advocate that exercise is one of our basic needs uh, that should be performed not only during the workday, but should be a paid part of your workday. Folks, you'll never change my mind about that. I don't care what you put on here for comments or what you cite for best practice for running a business. You won't change my mind that I think uh, an hour of exercise should be included inside the workday and then it should be paid for uh, as a paid hour of work or the gym membership should be paid by your place of employment. Uh, stronger, healthier employees miss work less. They live longer so they can work for you for longer and generate more income for you for longer. Again, you won't change my mind around that. I think that should fall in the basic needs category. So basic needs, are you establishing boundaries around that? Are you somebody who's just always available to work? You uh, just eat in front of a computer all day. Uh, you never stop. You never take a break. You never have a meal at home with friends or family members or even just to yourself where you have a moment alone. Start to think about boundaries there. We're humans. We're the most advanced species on the planet. We have advanced needs, right? We are a little bit smarter than a dog who uh, can learn pretty quickly uh, of how to behave around food and sleep and shelter and water. We have advanced needs. We have the ability to comprehend the concept of time, which, which no other creature does. So we need to start putting boundaries around time. What does that mean? Again, what you put in that time, only you know what's important. Time with your family, uh, time to sit down at the end of the day and, and have a meal together, 
uh, is meeting that time need. It's meeting that that food need, uh, having time to go to maybe your kids' events or family events or have time to yourself for your hobbies. You want to go rock climbing or you want to go for a bike ride after work and being expected to maybe document after work infringes upon that. Companionship, going and doing stuff with friends and family, those are all advanced needs that also deserve a boundary. Something that goes on my my schedule every day, what I like to call a a big rock, is I always know uh, when I'm going to work out for at least an hour. And I always know that at the end of the day, I'm going to stop for most days around six or seven so that I have time to sit down uh, with my wife and ideally eat dinner together and, and maybe watch a TV show or just do something together at the end of the day and spend a little bit of time together. But again, most of us don't have those boundaries established. We find ourselves doing work stuff late into the evening, uh, doing uh, things like documentation late into the evening, and that that influx of too much stuff crossing our boundary creates that feeling of disrespect and leads to that feeling of burnout. So we talked about behavior shaping. We've talked about establishing boundaries. How do we actually do the behavior shaping? Three different techniques I've learned. Some of them, some of them work better than others. The first is when you feel like your boundary has been crossed, whatever that might be. That might be uh, a phone call uh, late in the evening or a text message or an email, somebody physically coming to your house, right? Maybe Maybe grandma comes over uh, to try to see the baby or somebody comes to your door at nine o'clock trying to sell something, some sort of infringement on that boundary. Um, You feel that. What do you do? The first response uh, might be to escalate, right? That is getting mad, getting upset that your boundary has been crossed, yelling at somebody, telling them uh, directly, very directly um, in an emotional way. And what you're really saying there is, You've crossed the line. You have crossed past this boundary. You are now disrespecting me, but you're often not saying it that way, right? You might be saying uh, swear words instead. You might be raising your voice. So what does that do? That doesn't really change the equation. It really adds, uh, if we're thinking back to that chemical equation, it adds a lot of negative ions to that equation. Uh, It doesn't often change that person's behavior. uh, We we really haven't established with them what our boundary is um, or what they've done that has crossed that boundary. We've just screamed at them. It doesn't really lead to anything productive. Uh, If anything, it can make the behavior be repeated, uh, but now just in an escalated, more emotional situation. Some of us respond this way, that this is my tendency to respond to this way, and I'm learning uh, that's not an appropriate way to respond. Most of us respond this next way, which is to not respond, to just not acknowledge it. And we think that by ignoring it, people will magically learn um, that that behavior is not appropriate and have their behavior shaped and go upon with their day. And we know that's not the case, right? Getting that text message, having somebody come to the door, whatever it is, When that happens, if you just ignore it, it usually doesn't lead to any meaningful behavior change in that person. Uh, They don't learn what they're doing wrong. They don't learn that you don't like it. uh, And they're probably just more apt to continue to repeat it. It doesn't really change anything about the equation. It doesn't add more positive. It doesn't add more negative. It literally does nothing. It's like adding water into solution. It just makes the problem uh, a little bit bigger. The third way and probably the most effective way is to subtly let people know that the way they're behaving is inappropriate in a way that does not escalate things emotionally. This is a slow, gradual balancing of the equation. This is that slow training of your dog of learning days over days, weeks over weeks, months over months, that they can't run out the door as soon as you open the door, that they can't uh, jump on grandma when she walks in the door, they can't knock over the baby, whatever. This is that slow behavior change over time where they learn uh, that what they're doing is not appropriate and that it is a boundary with you that they have crossed. I think of an example of what I've started doing in the past couple months of when I know I'm going to be away from the computer, if I'm trying to take a vacation, if I'm trying to just be away for a long weekend, or if something has popped up Uh, personal emergency wise, of just putting up an away message on on my email that says, hey, I'm gone for whatever reason. You don't have to give a reason. You You don't owe anybody a reason. And just saying, I plan to answer emails or I do not plan to answer emails. This is when I expect to be back. Uh, or I have no idea when I'll be back. It doesn't really matter, right? You're laying out the expectation of your boundary, and then you're giving guidance 
on what is or what is not appropriate behavior. For me, <laughs> over the years, uh, boundaries have been crossed and I have not said anything about them. And that is uh, my fault, but also now starting to establish those boundaries in behavior shape involves stating kind of explicitly what those boundaries are. It is not okay to call or text my personal phone if I'm not available. It's not okay to try to reach me on social media as a way to get an email response. It's not okay to call my clinic and ask the people that work there to try to give me a message. It's not okay to try to find out who my wife is or who my friends are via social media and message them and ask them to give me a message or ask them if they can ask me to answer an email, right? That is all inappropriate behavior and laying that out explicitly might seem firm, it might seem mean, but I would say that it's very fair and it's very clear of, hey, here are my boundaries as far as communicating with me during this time. Please don't come past those boundaries, right? So we have laid out what our boundaries are. We've laid out a way that a person can also subtly learn that any of those things is probably not appropriate behavior for you personally or to interact with any other human being. So think about those things in your life. We all have them. Patients reach out late at night. Uh, this is something I work on as well with, with the folks at Health HQ at our clinic of, hey, if you keep answering those text messages from patients at 1130 at night, guess what? They're never going to learn that you don't like that. You haven't told them that's a boundary they shouldn't cross. And they're never going to learn because they haven't learned so far in their life that that's completely inappropriate behavior to message somebody so late at night after normal working hours. So by continuing to do that, you are continuing to encourage that behavior. You need to do the opposite, especially if you don't like it, of, hey, thanks for reaching out. I'll get back to you during normal business hours. You don't have to yell at them. You don't have to hey say, hey, dummy, it's 11 o'clock at night. Why are you texting me? But just laying out that expectation, hey, it's after normal business hours. I'll get back to you when I get back in the clinic during the work day. That, that, that lets that patient, person know there's a boundary. They've crossed it. And also maybe the way they behave is not appropriate for interacting with other human beings. And again, just like training your dog, Without the zap collar, we're slowly shaping that behavior over time. And at least in that interaction with that one person, they learn where your boundaries are and they learn the ideal behavior to interact with you and vice versa. And it leads to much more meaningful uh, conversations, uh, leads to much more meaningful interactions in a way that does not make you feel like you're getting, quote unquote, burned out. So behavior shaping, it can be done, it can be done even in folks who maybe have never learned behaviors are appropriate or inappropriate, uh, but it involves some work on your behalf, some work that might initially be uncomfortable, especially if you've never previously established boundaries. It takes time. Uh, it's a lot of subtle work instead of direct confrontation. So it's a little bit different approach than most of us are used to. But at the end of the day, if you feel like this is an area where you struggle, it's definitely something you need to start to work on because the, the, the concept of not doing anything will never move you forward in this realm. You'll never start to balance that chemical equation. It'll just stay unbalanced forever. You'll never create that table salt to turn in to get a grade on your chemistry lab. So I hope this was helpful. I'm happy to hear uh, discussion or, or have any comments uh, here on Instagram or, or via email. I hope you all have a fantastic Thursday. I hope we have fun with Gut Check Thursday. If you're going to be at a live course this weekend, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye, everybody.